So in this video, I'm going to be talking about photoconductors. And these fun devices are just, uh, fundamentally, they're, they're very simple. They're just a chunk of material that has a certain resistance associated with it, or equivalently, a certain conductance. Uh, and when you apply light, so you apply some light of a given energy, the resistance goes down, or equivalently, the conductance goes up. Now, why does this happen? Well, photoconductors are typically semiconductors, and they've got a certain conductivity. Uh, and we know that the conductivity of a semiconductor is just proportional to the number of charge carriers in that semiconductor. If you want the uh, exact formula, it's just Q times the mobility times the number of charge carriers in that semiconductor. And I'm assuming that this is an n-type semiconductor. If you wanted, you could add in the p-type term as well, Q mu p p. And so if we can change the number of carriers inside this semiconductor, or the carrier density, by adding carriers uh, through injecting light, so when we have uh, light, we're going to generate a bunch of electron hole pairs inside this semiconductor, and so we're going to have more electrons uh, and more holes than we did at equilibrium. And so the conductivity is going to go up. Now for simplicity, we're going to ignore the holes, uh, which is basically the same thing here as assuming that mu n uh, is much larger than mu p, but we're just going to ignore them for simplicity so that we can get a sort of intuitive sense for what's going on inside this photoconductor. So the, the question is, how much does this conductivity change? So what is delta sigma? Well, it's, it's just equal to Q mu n times delta n. It just It's linear with the number of charge carriers or with the charge carrier density. So if we increase the charge carrier density by a certain amount, we're going to increase the conductivity by a certain amount as given by this equation. And so this is the basic idea of what's going on inside a photoconductor. Uh, but how do we actually go about measuring this photoconductor? Well, we, we can't measure conductivity directly. We need to measure the current that results uh, from applying a given voltage across this conductor. So for a given conductivity change, delta sigma, what we're actually measuring is a change in the observed current that's flowing through this conductor. So our circuit uh, electrically looks something like this. We're just connecting a voltage source to a resistor and that resistance is changing or the conductance is changing. So initially it might have been G naught uh, it's going to be G naught plus some delta G term when we apply light. And generally what we're interested in is the current that results from a given optical power change. Let's call that delta P. So what we'd ultimately like to find then is this delta I or the change in current that we observe coming out of this resistor uh, in relation to delta P. Or more precisely, we want to figure out its transfer function delta i over delta p. So this is equal to what? And we'd like a simple, uh, some, at least somewhat intuitive answer that gives us some ability to design these photoconductors. So how do we maximize this quantity? For a given optical power, I want to get the largest possible change in current. So let's try and figure this out. What is delta i? Well, we can just write out uh, Ohm's law because we know that this is a conductor. So it's the current is going to be in terms of the change in conductance. So delta I is just whatever voltage we're applying times delta G, our change in conductance. And now we have to know something about the, the geometry of our sample. Uh, but let's say that we're applying the voltage across uh, this region here. Then our conductor has a certain area to it. Uh, a certain area and a certain length associated with it. So let's call this length L. And the conductance is just, or the change in conductance, delta G, is just whatever our area is uh, divided by our length times delta sigma. But we know what delta sigma is for a semiconductor. We, we just wrote that up here. It's just related to the electronic charge, the mobility, and the change in the carrier density. So delta sigma is just Q mu n times delta n. And so we're slowly getting to where we want to be, but now we have to ask the question, well, what's the change in carrier density? And this is fairly straightforward as well. We know we've got a certain incident optical power 
Uh, so we, we call that delta P. And this is generating a certain number of electron hole pairs per unit time. Uh, so a bunch of electron hole pairs. And here we only are worrying about the electrons because we said that uh, mu n was much larger than mu p. And so after a certain amount of time, these generated electron hole pairs are going to recombine back into the semiconductor. So if we stopped generating, if we stopped continuously generating them, we stopped applying power, then we'd see that our additional electrons delta n would start to decay until they got back down to their equilibrium level. And if you go back to your intro semiconductor textbooks, you'll find that in steady state, uh, the change in the number of carriers due to some applied light is just this uh, generation rate due to light, uh, which we call GL, just multiplied by the electron lifetime. So that's the amount of time that it takes an excess electron on average to recombine somewhere in the lattice. And I'm gonna call this delta GL just to be consistent with our, uh, our delta notation in the power and the current. So now we're one step closer. Uh, delta N we, we know now is just equal to tau N times this term delta GL or the generation rate in this volume. And so this generation rate GL, this is just the number of electron hole pairs generated uh, per volume per unit time. And if we assume that each photon is able to generate a single electron hole pair, this should just be equal to the number of photons uh, incident on our structure uh, per volume per unit time. And so we can relate that to the optical power uh, because our the number of photons we know is just equal to, or the number of photons per unit time is just our power divided by the energy per photon. And if we want per unit volume in our semiconductor, we just need to multiply, or we need to divide everything by the volume of our semiconductor. So I'm gonna say that this is delta P again, to be consistent with our notation. And so this here is just delta G because it's the number of photons per volume per unit time that are absorbed by the semiconductor. So delta GL is just equal to delta P over h bar omega, or photon energy, times the area times the length. But there's one caveat, and that's that uh, it's possible that not all of our power that is at the surface of the detector actually makes it inside and gets absorbed. So some might get reflected, uh, some might actually pass all the way through, and so we account for this just by multiplying by some efficiency factor, eta. And in general, eta is less than one. And if you know what the, reflect, uh, what the reflectivity are, is and what the absorption coefficient is of this material, a good first approximation for eta is just one minus the re reflectivity times one minus e to the minus alpha L. And so this accounts for the photons that are actually absorbed by a material. This uh, gets rid of all the photons that are reflected by the surface of our material. And we haven't worried about secondary reflections, but this is a, this is a good first start for uh, an estimation of our efficiency factor. And so now we have delta I in terms of delta P. We just need to successively plug in uh, all of these values that we found one by one. And if you plug everything in, you should get that the transfer function delta I over delta P is just equal to our efficiency factor times Q over H bar omega times, and this is a little awkward, uh, mu N times our voltage divided by L squared times tau N. Now there's something kind of cute that we can do to make this a little more readable. Uh, and that's that we can say that the voltage is just the electric field uh, dropped over the length that we have of our conductor. Uh, and if we do that, then on the top we'll have mu n times the electric field. And this is nothing but the electron velocity. And then on the bottom we'll have L. So we have a velocity over a the length that, that the electron has to travel, which is just one over the time it takes the electron to get from one side to the other side. So from here to here. And so if we do that, then we have a new transfer function. Uh, we've still got this eta q over h bar omega out front, but now we've got this term tau n over tau t. And this is 
this is what's known as the photoconductive gain. And so if you want tau t in terms of the voltage, it's just uh, the length squared divided by the mobility times the voltage. And we can't do a lot about the mobility, but we can change the geometry of our device. So we can change the length and we can change the voltage. And so if we increase the voltage and we decrease the length of our device, then this tau t will get smaller and our gain will get bigger. So for a, a fixed optical power, we can actually get a larger current uh, than we would be able to otherwise just by tweaking this tau t, this transit time of the electron. And recall that tau n again is just our electron lifetime. Uh, in the semiconductor, so how long the excess electrons manage to stick around after being generated. And this is kind of interesting. So if we interpret it, uh, if we interpret this as a gain, and let's rewrite uh, this with delta P on the right hand side, then this term here is actually just the number of electron hole pairs, or it's Q times the number of electron hole pairs generated. So if this gain is bigger than one, then for every electron hole pair, we're actually able to get more than one electron's worth of current. And that's really interesting. And that's in contrast to, a, for example, a PIN diode, where every electron hole pair, so if we have uh, one electron, or actually I've been writing all my electrons in blue, one electron and one hole, these both get separated and then they get measured, and that's one uh, unit of current, or one electron's worth of current. But with a photoconductor, we can actually have more than one electron's worth of current for a given number of electron hole pairs generated. So this can actually be advantageous over a PIN photodiode if we need very high sensitivity. Because this term here, this is exactly what you'll get uh, for your PIN photo current, uh, where you just have the separation of these electrons and holes and then their subsequent uh, measurement. Whereas with a photoconductor, because our generated electrons are sticking around for longer, so because their lifetime, tau n, can be much larger than the time it takes them to get from A to B, we can actually measure a larger current for a given photo current. And that's pretty, that's pretty neat. That's pretty awesome. But keep in mind, this doesn't come for free. So we do have to apply either a much larger voltage or decrease the length of our device. And at some point, we're not gonna be able to do that anymore. It's just gonna get too thin or the voltage is gonna get too high. So there's limits to what we can do with our photoconductor uh, design, but we do have uh, significant uh, advantages over uh, just your standard photodiodes. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like down below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.